Now, the vast majority of stuff in food is sugar, starch, protein, fat, and water. That covers quite a lot of what's there. However, there's some really important things that that list didn't hit. Uh, some of these include minerals. For example, salt is not uh, created by living things. Uh, it has to come out of the environment. You might have some baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, another mineral sort of product. And um, besides those, there are things that are present in very small amounts. And so far, far less of a strawberry uh, then is the water, then is the carbohydrate, is the stuff that actually makes a strawberry taste strawberry flavored, the flavor chemicals. Now these tend not to be specifically uh, a starch, for example, or a protein, although there are some flavor proteins. Um, these tend to be different classes of chemicals whose makeup and mixture is unique to the different foods, which is why they taste and smell so differently. We're not going to go in depth on all of the different flavor chemicals right now. That would be its entire own course. Um, most of the flavor chemicals are not uh, material to the reactions that happen in food, but they are really important to why people like them and want to eat them. So periodically I'll be bringing up flavor chemicals and I'll show you a few of them here, but you should know this is only a very, very small amount and uh, we, I hope we'll be able to talk some more about flavors later on. So let's look at some of the other things that are in foods, keeping in mind that these are often very small percentages, both uh, by mass, but not always. So salt, commonly known as table salt, is sodium chloride. I've mentioned that before. Uh, it is a ion, so quite often uh, if you have a liquid or something that is uh, mostly liquid, you end up with that split apart as little positive NAs and negative CLs. And that is occasionally important for uh, work that we're doing. We'll be talking about that in the future. You'll also see potassium on food labels. It's often at a much, much lower level than sodium. And potassium is another ion typically. So its symbol is K. Take it up with the chemist if you don't like that as its symbol. Uh, and it's positive. It always also needs a counter ion. Quite commonly, that counter ion is chloride. So usually it's potassium chloride, uh, but we don't tend to track chloride in the food we eat. Uh, so if you look at a nutrition label, you just see sodium and potassium. Um, often the potassium isn't added necessarily. It's just something that came along for the ride because it's, say, naturally uh, a little more concentrated in bananas. Uh, iron, symbol is Fe, and uh, usually it's in food as a compound as well. Very, again, when you say this food is rich in iron, uh, that doesn't mean that this food is 50% iron by mass. It doesn't even mean this food is 1% iron by mass. Um, this down uh, in particular, iron, potassium, those will be things that are at, you know, 0.01% by mass. Um, we'll, we'll sometimes have uh, a lot more salt. You've all encountered foods that are very salty, but um, uh, the, this is important nutritionally and important for some reactions occasionally, but it is it tends not to be a structural element of the food. Uh, another fun chemical compound I thought I would include here, sodium bicarbonate. So there's our friend, that Na+. And here's what this looks like. So this is an organic salt. You see, that's what uh, that looks like. And this is baking soda. And as you're aware, uh, if you've made cookies, baking soda, important, got to be there, but not a structural component of the food, not by any means the majority of what's there, not doing a whole lot uh, for the nutrition, but important 
in its contribution to the reactions. Uh, sodium bicarbonate in particular is a base. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, it's sort of the opposite of an acid. So I'll write it this way. I'm going to put our simplification star there. Um, but a base is what cancels out an acid in general. And that's why um, sodium bicarbonate is something we tend to use when we are also using a acid in the food, because when the two of them get together and they react, uh, we get lots of carbon dioxide bubbles. And those carbon dioxide bubbles uh, make the food light and airy. That's part of what it's doing in the cookies. Now let's spend a little time talking about flavors. And actually, I'm going to put colors in here too. So there's some really, really, really neat compounds in this area. Here's just a couple of examples. Up top here we see beta carotene, which is the compound that is uh, mostly responsible for carrots being orange. You can tell that from its name. You can see it's a very uh, like fancy looking thing, right? Like look at all these double bonds. It kind of looks like a fat a little bit there in the middle-ish, sort of vaguely, but not really, because then it's got all these other carbons hanging off of it. And then there's these rings at the end. And holy cow, what are we going to do with that? Well, it is uh, this uh, structural property of having that kind of long chain and lots of double bonds that helps make this be uh, something that uh, let, uh, changes color. Um, Beta carotene also uh, is a vitamin. So it's a thing that our body uses, can't synthesize itself and needs in order uh, to be healthy. So, uh, and it is by no means, again, something that is a structural component of a food. So even though carrots and pumpkins are orange and they're orange all the way through, and you'd be like, wow, there's gotta be a ton of this stuff here. Again, if you look at the uh, what a carrot is made of by mass, uh, this won't typically even reach 1%. It's going to be less than that. So that's um, that wasn't the less than symbol. Let's try that again. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, less than 1%. Anyway, um, here's another interesting flavor. This stuff, cinnamaldehyde, you'll notice it's a smaller chemical, uh, but still kind of funny looking, got that big old ring on it. Um, this is the stuff that makes cinnamon hot. So it's cinnamon flavor. And you might say, uh, when you look at flavors, that um, since cinnamaldehyde has that nice name, suggests cinnamon, that that's all there is to the story. And you'd be semi-right. It's like most of the flavor of cinnamon, but no, by no means all of the flavor of cinnamon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what uh, that gives us a way to kind of sense the difference between something that is uh, a natural flavor, that means we extracted it from cinnamon, versus a artificial flavor, which means we composed it chemically from constituent bits that we reacted ourselves. And so cinnamaldehyde, uh, artificial or natural, the chemical looks the same, but in the natural, there's lots of other stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean other flavor compounds. So in a uh, natural flavor source, such as cinnamon or vanilla or... Uh, cloves, there will be the kind of number one flavor chemical that we are familiar with that tastes most like that stuff. Uh, but then the natural source will tend to have uh, hundreds, perhaps, of other compounds that also contribute to the flavor and the sensory aspect of that food and are what gives this sort of depth difference, texture, richness, whatever word you want to use to describe food from the uh, natural version as compared to the artificial version, which will have the single one note. 
sort of like playing a pure tone on a synthesizer versus playing that same note on a violin. There's other stuff going on in the violin. There's resonance, the other strings make a difference, the wood makes a difference. Whereas with a synthesizer, I can make a pure sine wave that's at exactly the right number of hertz and it sounds purely that sound. Here are a whole bunch of other flavor chemicals that and color chemicals that I drew uh, that uh, just to give you an idea of kind of the differences and breadth of what we're talking about here. Uh, so uh, we have stuff from rosemary, we have menthol, which is that cooling sensation, eugenol, also a nice cooling sensation, capsaicin, which is the hot stuff in peppers, uh, caramel furanone, which is a nice kind of toasty, caramelly flavor, a few cheese flavors, uh, chrysanthemum, which gives you a nice purple color, diacetyl, which is uh, a butter flavor. Something else that's worth making a point over while we're talking about flavors is uh, for almost every single one of these compounds, you would not want to have a spoonful of just that. Like it would be bad. Um, so icky slash unsafe in high quantity or purity. And what do I mean high quantity? Uh, well, you know, if you ate 10 grams of this, any of this stuff straight, you would somewhere between uh, get a horrible upset stomach and uh, and injury or poisoning. That's, that's possible with some of these. And you say, wait a minute, that's horrible. I don't want to be poisoned by food. And that's right, we don't. But it's because uh, these chemicals, which are naturally present in the foods where they arise, are there at a very, very, very low concentration, such that mostly, most of the time, in most of our understanding, uh, it, it doesn't really do anything bad. And that's, there's a, there's a star of simplification here, star of simplification. Um, but, uh, if you think about it, you know, humans have been eating rosemary uh, for millennia, right? So we don't tend to associate that with any problems, even though if you uh, sat down and ate straight up uh, rosmarinic acid, uh, you would not be a happy person. So uh, something to keep in mind uh, over and over again, we will see this in food um, a lot of a chemically pure substance tends not to be good for you as a food. But that mixed in proportion the way uh, we have always consumed it tends to be fine. And finally, I know this has gone on a bit, but there's a few more things we want to talk about. Here's a, a, a set of other food chemicals that we are going to run into that tend uh, to be used in relatively small quantity, but uh, in fact have big effects. So let's talk about emulsifiers. Emulsifiers are things that are kind of fat-like on one end and kind of uh, water-loving. Remember I talked before about non-polar and then polar on the other end. And so a common look for this is something that might be charged on one end and then out the other end have a long carbon chain. Uh, uh, some popular things that are emulsifiers are uh, egg yolk. So I'm going to just write egg yolk. But what's in egg yolk is less uh, thin. You've probably seen that on a food label somewhere. And also maybe you've seen mono or diglycerides. Remember, a fat is a triglyceride. So if you just lop one of those fatty acids off, you're left with a diglyceride. If you lop two of them off, you get a monoglyceride. And all of those are emulsifiers. That means since they are chemicals that have a water-loving end and a fat-loving end, they can we can use them to bridge the gap between 
water, and fat, and get a nice creamy salad dressing, for example. Another chemical we'll see a lot of, uh, another chemical class we'll see a lot of, is acids. And this over here is citric acid, and this over here is acetic acid. So this is the one that's in vinegar, and citric is the one that's in uh, lemons, and also pretty much every citrus fruit. And when you put these things in water, uh, what they do is one of their hydrogens, at least, tends to pop off. So in, in the case of acetic acid, it would be this one here, and you'd be left with an O negative and an H positive. And so we'd have an, a very polar substance, um, and uh, uh, the presence, again, simplification star, the presence of those H pluses is a good indicator that something is an acid. And the more of them there are, uh, the more the pH drops from seven, which is neutral, to lower numbers, which is acidic. Okay, uh, so acetic acid in vinegar, it's in balsamic vinegar, it's got a distinctive smell, it's got a distinctive taste. Citric acid, also distinctive smell and taste. We'll also probably bump into lactic acid at some point, but this is a fine set of acids to start with. Um, keeping in mind also that even when you have something, like you go to the grocery store and you buy uh, vinegar, uh, it usually says on it, diluted to 5% acid, that means it's 5% acetic acid, um, and the balance of it is water. So even in that case, uh, even though you've just bought vinegar and bought quote-unquote acid, uh, you actually mostly just bought water. Finally, I also want to mention preservatives. Some examples of them uh, are shown below. Uh, we'll get into their uh, chemical makeup if and as we need to, but I just want you to know that they are around, and again, usually in amazingly small quantity, uh, and in some cases, they are there uh, only to be preservatives. Um, in some cases, they're there also as a flavor compound. So for example, citric acid can be a preservative. Also, acetic acid can be a preservative, but because those things tend to be thought of more as components of flavor than of, uh, as preservatives, they don't get listed that way on the label. Whereas uh, benzoic acid really has no reason to be in a food except to be a preservative, uh, and therefore it's listed that way.